So, hello everyone. I'm David Jays and I edit Dance Gazette, the magazine of the Royal Academy of Dance. We've known for a long time about the issues around race and ballet, what we might call hashtag ballet so white. But this tumultuous year, where the coronavirus pandemic enforced a hiatus in the way we work, and then the murder of George Floyd ignited the reach and focus of the Black Lives Matter movement. This year seems to offer an opportunity to reflect, to rethink, maybe even to reset how ballet operates so that we can create something better on the other side. And with this in mind, it's a privilege to join three remarkable dancers who between them have a wide range of experience and insight across the ecology of ballet. Teresa Ruth Howard, joining us from New York, danced with the Dance Theatre of Harlem, among others, and is now a writer, an educator, a strategist and consultant, working with many leading dance organizations. Uh, Kirsten Mariah, Mariah Fentroy, who's in Boston, uh, also performed with Dance Theatre of Harlem and is now a soloist with Boston Ballet. And Joshua Twifa uh, is speaking from Kent. Uh, he danced with the Royal Ballet and is now an RAD dance teacher and co-created the RAD's Moving Summer Programme for online learning just recently. So the extraordinary international impact of the Black Lives Matter movement this spring, I think has encouraged everyone to reflect on the worlds we inhabit. And so to begin, I wondered, can I ask you what this period has meant to each of you? Uh, Teresa, can I begin with you? Uh, sure. Um, well, it's, 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 it's a lot because it's not something, I think it's fascinating that, that, that for, for white people, this is, this is a new sort of revelatory moment. Whereas for most black and, and brown people, this is, this is just life. And so we're like, welcome to the party. Um, um, <laughs> we've, been, we've been waiting for you. Yes. So, so there, is, um, there are a lot of emotions, right? Like we, we, we see the brutality projected into the world when we watch that video of George Floyd being murdered. Um, we experience it as we walk down the streets and we enter stores and even in the space of whiteness that is ballet, um, that sort of um, marginalization. Um, and it's very raw right now because COVID is disproportionately affecting um, black people. Um, and, and we have these uprisings and so it's very raw. So for me personally, the work that I do in terms of trying to help ballet diversify, although I feel it's very, very important um, against the backdrop of everything that's happening in the world, <laughs> it's, you know, so it, it's contradictory, right? I, you, I keep working because it is important and the world will reopen and hopefully, you know, ballet will be there. But at the same time, there are far more important things that, um, that are on the heart and on the mind. Sure. And, and Kirsten, as, as Teresa says, it's, it's a very raw period. How, how has it felt for you? I'm, I agree that it has felt incredibly raw. It has um, forced everyone, I think, especially people of color, to relive some of the things that they've been through. Um, through conversation because so many people are interested in, in hearing our story now um, suddenly more than ever. Um, so it, it kind of opened up a lot of wounds that maybe never actually healed. Um, but I also think that similar to what Teresa was saying, it, it, it is a little bit of, of a conflicting feeling because this conversation is so needed and um, I'm glad that it's happening because it needed to happen one way or another. Um, but, but under the circumstances, it's, it's hard. And though um, it's a conversation that began in the States, it so quickly spread 
um, across the world, and it certainly resonated, I think, in the UK. Uh, Joshua, how does it, how does that conversation feel to you? Well, um, it's long overdue. Um, I teach on a musical theatre degree course, and it all happened during our third summer term. And I actually have a lot of black students on the course. And for me, my role widened. It was, it was to be there to support them through that as well. You know, there was the COVID, they've got the assessments coming up and then the Black Lives Matters movement. Um, for me, it was, it was easy to distract myself because I had to look after them. Yeah. But it is raw. Um, I, it, it does strike me that you've all navigated very rich dance careers um, in an environment which we know doesn't always encourage black artists. And I just wondered how you found those journeys um, as, as you look back. Joshua, in your dancing and teaching careers, has ballet been a welcoming place? I've got to say, I never wanted to be a ballet dancer. I didn't know ballet existed. Um, I started going to tap because my sister was doing tap and I would go and pick her up and I thought it looked really fun and, you know, to make all that noise. Um, and then I, I started doing a couple of ballet classes because the teacher recommended me to do it. But the Royal Ballet School, what the main reason I got into ballet was the Royal Ballet School had uh, an outreach program where they were going to inner London schools and they were trying to encourage to introduce children to movement that wouldn't normally have access to it or necessarily have families that could afford it. So I went to this four week course and at the end of it, they invited me to join the junior associate program at the Royal Ballet School. And within a year, I'd kind of jumped up a year and I was off to White Lodge. So I found the Royal Ballet School very proactive in actually getting into the communities and finding what they thought was talent. Um, and even getting into the Royal Ballet School, I had a fast track. I, I think I did one ballet class and they offered me a place. So I was really fortunate, you know, to be able to slip, be in the right place at the right time. Um, but also the Royal Ballet School is just like the company. It becomes a bit of a family. Um, so I was really blessed that I didn't have those struggles of fighting to get into a company and then fighting the attitude of you know race. I was really lucky. And once I was in the Royal Ballet, it was like a family, we were all supporting each other. Um, I actually was lucky in that I never thought about my color when I was in the Royal Ballet. How lucky is that? Um, even with casting, I mean, the hardest, I think the hardest thing for me was having to pancake my shoes darker to get, to get the flesh colour. But luckily now those companies are actually producing skin colour for everyone. It's two, uh, 2020. <laughs> yes, <laughs> 2012. But we've got there. We've got there. But yeah, no, I've been, I've been really lucky. But now, now that I'm teaching, I'm very aware that a lot of businesses, schools, and that are looking at statistics. Mm. And it made me reflect and think back on, would I want to be a statistic to make the school look good? Or would I want to be in the Royal Ballet School because I was good at ballet? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So there's that balance of, I think institutions have to be very clever. They have to get out and they have to find the talent. They've got to nurture the talent. And something that really has been inspirational for me over this lockdown is um, Instagram. There's a young man in, a, in an academy in Nigeria, I think it's called Leap Academy. Mm -hmm. And I watched this young boy doing turns in second, doing leaps in the pouring rain on concrete out in a yard. And it, it, I burst into tears and thought he was so happy and he wasn't worried about the perfect sprung floor and the polished mirrors. Do you know, it was just about dance. So I think giving those small academies a platform to show off their talent, it's like they're opening a door and saying, here we are, come, you know. And I think that's where we have to look at moving forward in, in finding funding to actually give those opportunities. 
Um, Kirsten, you recently uh, wrote about the expectations that are placed on a black, black ballerina to dance in particular companies, particular kinds of repertoire. And I just wondered for you, has that been a, a difficult journey? How, how has that felt? Yeah, um, so to start, I have to acknowledge that I am biracial. My mom is Caucasian, my dad's African-American. My mom was a ballet dancer and my dad was a commercial dancer. So um, I kind of grew up in a little bit of both. I had hip hop and I had ballet and I had tap and I had these things. Um, and I had my choices, but my mom primarily raised me and her, she did, I think she did a really fantastic job of teaching me to look at myself um, in a positive light. Uh, so I was sort of blissfully ignorant for a lot of my childhood in, as far as race goes in dance. Um, she always taught me to look at my skin golden and that the reason why I'm different in a room of people is because my skin is like shining. Um, and it, it, it's a positive thing and not a negative thing. And so I think she did a really great job with that. But because of that, I was also, you know, um, blissfully ignorant. And it wasn't until later when I started to branch out of my home school that uh, I, I became a little more aware of, of race in dance, um, of my differences, of the way that I am seen differently by others. Um, and, and so, there has been also a lot of being in the right place at the right time and, and being lucky that the right person saw me, um, the right person with a good heart saw me or um, that didn't have that, that bias in them saw me. Um, but I've also had a lot of looking back on my training, people that encouraged me to, to dance in very specific places, Alvin Ailey. Houston Ballet, Dance Theatre of Harlem, and ultimately my first professional job was with Dance Theatre of Harlem, and I wouldn't change that for anything because it, it was in that organization that I learned the value of being a Black woman in the art, and that I'm not just a statistic, I am important and I'm as relevant as anyone else. Um, and so looking back, I, I, did, I did have that, that kind of biased encouragement from other people, but because of that biased encouragement and because I listened to that to a certain degree and followed through with going to Dance Theater of Harlem, I learned so much more about the arts and about the importance of diversity in the arts. Um, so I'm grateful. Sure. And Teresa, you, your work has uh, kind of impacted on, on ballet in all sorts of different aspects and from all sorts of different perspectives, um, both in the studio, on stage, coming into organisations as well. H how has, have, has that been like multiple journeys or, or is there a connective thread there? Uh, it's really interesting because I fell into this work because I have a big mouth. And <laughs> <laughs> As a writer, you know, you, you put things out there and then, you know, things go boom. But okay. um, I, what, what fascinates me about this work, like I, as a ballet dancer, I dance with Dancers of Harlem. I, to answer your, your first question, um, yes and no, right? I, I came up, I trained at Pennsylvania Ballet. And at that time, it, it didn't feel, I knew I was black, but I didn't feel like I didn't belong. Um, and at a very early age, I believe eight years old, I was introduced to Dance Theater of Harlem. And for me, when I saw that like cornucopia of brownness of people who looked exactly like me and loved exactly what I loved, that's where I wanted to dance, right? And so that's, I was like beeline <laughs> to Dance Theater of Harlem. So I never actually placed myself in the um, in that world of whiteness as a quote unquote professional, right? And so I have a very in, in that way my experience is very different. Although I will say that even at Dance Theatre of Harlem, the culture of ballet was predominant over the blackness of the space, right? So the rules of ballet that means the aesthetics of ballet were very present, right? That means body type and, and, and what your legs and feet look like. And even to, and this is really important, even to the laws of colorism and how they play out. They played out in Dance of the Harlem the same way that they played out in the world. And so 
what's interesting about our conversation here is that um, the idea that the possibly the lighter you are, the more blendable you are, the less of a quote unquote issue you present in, in, in that space of whiteness, right? And so the diversity of the spectrum of blackness um, that is very much allowed in whiteness, right? So you can have a, a blonde, a brunette, a redhead, you know, someone who's a little olivey, and it doesn't matter. But in the spectrum of blackness, especially in, 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 in ballet with the aesthetics, it plays a huge role. It makes a difference between whether or not you're considered a prince or a ballerina or a principal, right? And um, those are the things in my work that beyond just, you know, painting all quote unquote, blackness or brownness the same, um, because it's actually not. Um, that's what, when you peel the layers open, is the real, is a, that, that makes ballet really face itself and say, well, what are you actually saying? Mm -hmm. You know, what's actually acceptable in this space? What are you actually comfortable with in terms of um, not just talent, but the roles that you see people in, if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's the part that, that is fascinating to me about, about this work. And one of the things that, that seems so interesting is, is how change is such a far-reaching process, as you've alluded to. If you're going to make change in what happens in the ballet studio, you need to change the culture of ballet. And to change the culture of ballet, you kind of have to change society. <laughs> and to, 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 to do something about capitalism, you know, it kind of, it, it's, it's a huge conversation. So I wonder how, and it, and it feels daunting, of course it does. So Teresa, how do individuals and organizations make meaningful change? How do you kind of get them to not either avoid that conversation entirely because it's just too huge or wait for society to catch up? I think you're right. I think that, that the overall culture with a big C has to change before the culture is with the small C change. But um, so I say that I don't shift organizations, I shift people because we have evidence that you can, you can put laws on the books and it doesn't mean that, that people actually you know, apply the law or apply the law the way that it was meant to be applied. It's actually the people, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that is true. But I would, I would argue that it's actually, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. It's actually not as hard as we like to make it, right? Because if, if organizations are people, mm -hmm. then there are people who are making the decisions. So people just have to choose differently. And, and I sit in these rooms where everybody's like, ooh, pondering, what do we do? Oh my gosh, you know? And I, I go, well, you could just look at the model of Dance Theater Parliament that Arthur Mitchell built for you. Because it actually took ballet and made it accessible. It's built on the model that we now call outreach, right? Um, and saying that like anybody and anybody can come, it's actually, the training is actually affordable. Um, and as Mr. Mitchell would say, and Kristen, you'll laugh, if you can hit the high C, then you can, you can hit the high C, right? Um, and, but, but we don't look at an organization like Dance of Harlem, primarily because it is a Black organization. And somehow whiteness doesn't think that it can find the answers to these very difficult problems, you know, in, in, in spaces of Blackness. And that's really just the truth. Um, because it's Arthur Mitchell, uh, uh, encouraged everyone, included everyone. It didn't matter where you were from. The organization almost immediately was uh, multicultural, but it, under the, the umbrella of blackness. But there were white people in the school and the company almost immediately. So it's, it's about what your philosophy and your core values and your mission are. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm aware of you know, the irony of saying this on a Zoom call, but I mean, I guess it's easy for the discussion and for the, the, the convening of a committee and for the series of meetings to actually become a substitute for anything meaningful ever happening. Um, something that looks like, like action, but is actually inaction. Um, 
I, I wonder, uh, Joshua and, and uh, Kirsten, if, if what Teresa said resonated with you in terms of how change can happen. I, uh, it's, you know, in England, there is, so, I'm sure it's the same in the States, there are so many little villages and towns that still survive without a single black person in it. I went last year to watch a student that was playing a role in um, a musical at the Chichester Festival. And this lovely little white lady sat next to me and she was like, oh, where are you from? And I was like, from London. And her reaction was, there can't be many English people left in London now. And she didn't realize what, how awful what she said was and hurtful and luckily I'm strong enough to stand there and think poor you you know she didn't say it with any malice or spite it was just ignorance and she was like a 60 something year old woman and you just think this this society is going to take a it's going to take a while and a bit of patience because everyone needs to take the responsibility of educating themselves, you know? They've got to want to educate themselves. But I was born in Maida Vale. I was, I'm a Paddington boy, you know? Um, my skin's darker, but I'm British. <laughs> and I just couldn't believe what, what, you know? So I think, you know, the audiences need to change. Mm -hmm. For sure, yeah. You know, um, which, the sponsors, you know, it, it, it's never ending. Everyone needs to wake up, take responsibility and educate themselves. Yeah, and, and again, that, that sense of the audience goes back to uh, Teresa's point about uh, the change that any company can make by hiring uh, choreographers of colour by making sure that that voice is, is prominently there because it's uh, and we often focus on dancers but of course there's um, it's what happens behind the scenes it's what happens in the offices um, as well as on the creative teams and those are lots of choices that we that are less visible perhaps but can have such an impact. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered Kirsten how, how does uh, how does that conversation feel to you? Well, I think that it's, um, uh, I have to look at it from like the dancer's perspective because that's where I'm most involved right now. Um, and I haven't stepped further than that quite yet. Um, I think that it's important for our, for every company, especially if they carry the name of a city that they're representing, for them to represent the community that they're performing for and for the audiences that they're performing for. So there's like a couple of different ways that I can take this conversation. It's like creating a, a space that, that makes the audience feel safe walking into the doors to watch this theater and having something that they can see themselves in, in whatever way that that person is. So like having a diverse, a more diverse group or, or, or um, I mean like diversifying the roster of a company. Um, and how do we diversify the roster of a company? We have to like, start from the very beginning we and it's going to take a long time we have to like plant the seeds we have to get the young the younger the younger people to be interested tell their friends that they're also welcome in this house and then to grow those people all the way up through the company and then you can have like your own homegrown dancers that relate to the city that you're trying to perform for mm -hmm. um, and that's just like something that I think I think that a lot of, in these conversations that, that people are having well, why aren't we solving the problem? Why aren't we solving the problem? Um, or like, how do we diversify our roster? How do we get more dancers of color? How do we do this? It's, it's, and, and there's like not a level of patience or understanding that these things are going to take time. You can't snap your fingers and poof, you have a more diverse page. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you have to start from the beginning and be willing to put in the work to like water these seeds and like watch them grow, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. <laughs> no, absolutely. And that, of course, starting at the very beginning, I mean, means teaching and means both the teachers and, uh, and their students may, being able to feel that this is an art form for them. Um, we did, I jump uh, in for one second and just, just, I just want to point out that, like, colonial colonialism is to the UK <laughs> as slavery is to the US. 
And so, Joshua, what you were saying about this woman who's like, oh, can't be, you know, many London, Londoners left. Yeah. It's, the UK is not dealing with the effects of colonialism and the fact that when you colonize and you essentially open your country up to, to brown people, yeah. then you unwittingly change the demographic of your nation, right? And what it means, therefore, to be British, mm. right? And so that's why you have people in like smaller towns and maybe even not so smaller towns <laughs> thinking that somehow this is still their, their country, yeah. not your country. Yeah. It's the same thing here in the States. And it's, it is a nationalistic issue when you are denying your history, right? Until you until you own that and absorb it and say, okay, these, this is what happens, this is the byproduct, then you're unwilling, you're, you're pretending, it's like a, you know, the year of magical thinking, yeah. that somehow these brown and black people don't actually belong yeah. in, in, in this country and they don't have ownership yeah. of, of the country. And so I think that the, that's, so we talk about the big C and the small C, you know, that's the big C part, you know, um, but we as, I think, artists in these institutions can acknowledge that history and begin to sort of like make those sort of cultural artistic reparations in ways. I guess it must be tiring as well if you're the only person in, you, in your company or the only person in the rehearsal studio or in the dance class as well. I mean, does, is that sort of burden of having to be a kind of an official diversity officer for your your company is something you, you, you've you've had to deal with. Um, Kirsten, I don't know if that's if yeah. <laughs> you've had yeah, that, that uh, bad forced on you. I mean, just like for uh, a, a fact that I faced when I left Dance Theatre for Home and joined Boston Ballet, I was the first African American woman to join the company in ten years. And I'm still the only African American woman in the company, and I've been here. I'm going to my fourth season now. Um, and so, so yeah, there's that, there's that. But coming with that, I understood that there was a level of responsibility that I was that I was given um, to teach people, and and I and I, I think that that's a good thing. I I took that as like not a burden, but 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 as kind of a a, a job for me to do uh, it's just and that someone someone has to take that step and and yes i want them to, to further diversify their roster and not be the only one because i'm tired of having to explain why my hair is more difficult to put up in a twist or like why ha having to point out the difference between like putting me in a wig and putting someone else in a wig because their hair is too short like why is that um but but i think that it's like it's it's kind of it's a job that I have to do, and and um, but yeah, it's 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 hard because especially being a being a, a black woman, if if you walk into the studio and you're too upset that day, uh, then you're seen as an angry black woman, or you know if you're frustrated about something, you're seen in a different light than I think a lot of other people are. So you have to have this like constant like internal dialogue and like checking yourself to make sure that, that you are presenting yourself in a way that is presentable because you've kind of been taught that, that you can be seen wrong at any moment. Um, so that, that sense of weight is, is hard, but I also think that um, I'm happy to have the responsibility. And Joshua, we, um, I guess there's a, a, a similar level of responsibility for uh, dance teachers, because certainly in ballet, I know it's slightly different in different genres, but certainly in ballet, there is a real lack of, of black dance teachers. It's um, uh, uh, such a small number, certainly in the UK. I wonder yeah. if that sense of kind of being able to, to represent to young people the sense that, there, you know, there is a future, this is a career, this is a path you could follow. My approach with, especially because I'm mainly teaching on the musical theatre degree course, I do the outreach projects as well for RAD and the boys, you know, trying to encourage boys in dance mm. uh, with boys only. Um, I think it's very important for me to look at how I was taught, look at the negatives 
and the negative effects that came from that teaching and avoid it, mm. progress from it. Mm. I, I, made, I made a vow when I went into teaching because you know, it, some of the training can be really tough and it can leave you with real insecurities. Um, so I made a vow with myself that I would never be that person. So they're just gonna get bigger, stronger. Um, so the first thing that I changed is the vocabulary I use with them, the way that I communicate mm -hmm. with them. I don't like the powerful being at the top and the disciples at the bottom. We, we very much bounce off each other. We work together to find what works for each other. Do you know what I mean? Everyone's got a different way. And my first thing I say is there is no one way of doing something, you know? And ballet is a bit about faking it most of the time, you know? It's finding that escape route. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, for me, it's very important to build um, with my students that one-on-one -on -one relationship with them. They know I'll be there for them. I'm at the end of the phone or the end of an email. So you build that trust so that they can move forward. And it's amazing how many of my young black guys that um, have started with me have um, been in close communication over the past couple few months, you know? And it's nice to know that you're that person that's always there at the end of an email or a text message. Um, even if you're having to kick them up the bum saying, why weren't you on a Zoom class today? <laughs> you know, I know that you've, you're stressed and you've got a lot of things on your mind. Just send me a little message saying, I'm okay. That's all I need. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it will be great when we have more black teachers out there, especially more black male or, you know, out there. Um, but right now, what I'm really focusing on is getting getting um, the introduction, as you were talk, talking about, Kristen, about finding those seeds to plant, to water, you know? And there's a lot of, ta as I said earlier on Instagram, there's a lot of talent and interest out there. And being able to give them the opportunities, you know, if they're living in a little village in Nigeria, opening those doors so they can have the training they deserve, you know? It's also opening the doors to their parents and their families and having them understand the value of the arts because if, if these people have never been able, been welcome in these conversations, then why would they want to put their kids in that place as well? And yeah. do they have a place to make money in this job? Or, yeah. you know, it, it, it's having that conversation as well and bringing yeah. their entire families in. Yeah. Um, you just remind me, there was another, going back to Instagram, there's another dance academy in the States that I saw that have a program and it's a mixture of ballet and Pilates where the fathers get to do the class with the child. And I watched, I watched that and I just thought, oh my God, can you imagine British fathers doing that, mm, I don't know if they would have the, you know, I won't say what I was going to say. I don't know if they've got the inner strength to do that, but it was amazing to see a studio full of black children having fun with their fathers. And the fathers were so into it. And I was like, if we could make that work over here, that would be pure magic. But there's a few barriers to break down about masculinity in this country still. Here's what I find interesting. Um, it, it, when I first started this work, one of the, the things that I noticed is that, uh, Kristen, to go back to the idea of like, we have to start at the beginning, like it's about the pipeline because we have to have more brown and black dancers in the pipeline to make it to the end, that would make it to the stage, that after the stage become the teachers, choreographers, uh, hopefully artistic directors, whatever. But what's, what, what I found was that ballet organizations were conflating their outreach programs with their diversity initiatives, right? And so your outreach program is generally something that's happening in a non-dance context, right? In a cafeteria, a gym, a school, you know, a, a rec center. Um, it's, it's sparse training. It's not really how you make a dancer. You hope that they will matriculate into the actual program, 
right? And so I'm like, they, these people, these children look like the people that you want to, you know, populate your pipeline with. But the reality of it is, is that the majority of um, dancers come from working in middle class backgrounds, white, black, whatever. They come from working in middle class backgrounds. The minute that you, I will use this term, ghettoize this initiative and you look only at people who are in economic crisis, right? You're not going to be successful because it's a middle-class structure and you need certain things. You have to have the, the ability to cart kids back and forth to school, right? So there needs to be a certain amount of flexibility in a support system that oftentimes people who are economically disadvantaged just don't have. So unless you're w wanting to, you know, partner with Uber to, to cart people back and forth or create some sort of, you know what I mean? It's unsustainable. And so why are we not looking? And it leans into this, this um, the stereotype that all black people are poor. When in fact there is a middle class, there's a working, working middle class and an upper class. But yet we're not looking at those families to say, hey, instead of playing field hockey or soccer, come take a ballet class. And so that is an implicit bias that feeds into this idea that somehow black people have to, they're not sophisticated enough to love the arts. When in fact, in the state, 1926, um, Dr. Dr. Uh, uh, E.B. Du, du Bois, there was a whole movement of using art and culture as a way of bringing the community together. So it's all these like fallacy, this fallacy about, about blackness, mythology about blackness. That, that actually, no, we have been in opera, we've been in classical theater, we haven't been in, in, in the mainstream because we weren't allowed to, but we've created our own spaces to do it. And so it's, it's just open the doors. How about that? <laughs> that, would be, that would be a start, right? Just yeah. open the doors and, and authentically um, welcome people. And Kristen, it, it is your job, but it's not. Right, like it's a job that's put on us. Like, if would you really take that job if you didn't have to, if it wasn't assigned to you? No. So, <laughs> so that's the extra burden that a dancer like Kristen goes in, and she's got to do all her pirouettes, all her arabesques, all her roles, and she's got to take on the emotional labor mm. of educating white people about her and themselves. That's what this, I think, this movement is really highlighting. It's like, do your own work. Yeah. Don't put that on, on us. We're happy to support. We've got our own stuff to deal with. Um, but this is everybody's job. Not just the onus isn't on the people who have been oppressed. Yeah. Right? That's got it. That's where we're, we're, we're stopping that. Sorry. I, had, I just want to put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're getting paid extra, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> You should put that in your contract. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I will <laughs> add on. <laughs> and I, I guess that's something that we're hoping will happen after the, this year is that um, the, the willingness to change in, in organizations is, is going to become genuine. And I don't know if, if you've all seen signs of that yet if it's too early to tell whether there's just a real now commitment to uh not just talk the diversity talk but to make uh to take action to, to make changes is that is that something um all of you have seen yet i mean i think that it's that's something that's gonna again take some time to actually know if there's real follow-through i mean i think that there are a lot of organizations that are sort of scrambling to prove that they're anti-racist um, since the murder of George Floyd and, and um, the Black Lives Matter movement started to really like blow up everywhere. Um, became, but but I, I think it's going to take some time for the work to actually be seen and, and, and prove that this is not something that they're doing right now and that it is going to benefit or going to change for the next year and then go back and like eat slowly back into like how things used to be. It's, um, I mean, I hope that that this is this is real, long-lasting change that 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 organizations are implementing. But there's no way to know in the immediate future. I don't think. Yeah. Please tell me if I'm wrong. I think that 
so I've been doing this for now almost, I guess five, almost six years now. And, and I'll tell you where you'll see it first, right? Is, is in the schools because schools have more elasticity. They're more porous. Um, education has, is more compassionate because it's dealing with children, right? There's, there's possibility there. So, so a number of, there's already been a lot of, of work done on uh, broadening where you audition, right? Who you send out on auditions, um, uh, securing additional funding to offer things like scholarships and, and the packages that schools are offering to um, specifically black dancers and dancers of color um, are, are different, right? So the pipeline is, we'll see that change. I think we see that already. I think it, it um, where it gets, now go behind the scenes, um, in terms of admin, right, and production and, and, and the technology, all those, all those split spaces require turnover, right, Requ require turnover and also where you're putting that, that ad, where you're looking for the new replacement. Uh, they're learning in, in that regard. Now, do Black people want to take those jobs? <laughs> I don't know, because they may not want to be in that space where they have to like Kristen said, take on the emotional labor every day of educating or being in that space. Um, I think we are seeing more black dancers ascend into companies, um, but that's where we start to, to it, it gets like this, is that the culture has to then really shift because then we have to look at repertory. We have to look at the stories that you're telling and who gets to tell them. You have to look at the culture of the actual of the actual company, right? That hierarchical thing, the, what are the aesthetics of a company? Um, there's a lot of not fitting, right? W let, let's clarify what, what isn't the fit. And, and that's where people go, oh, it's so subjective. Well, it could be, or we could just really talk about aesthetics plainly because we do it in the lobby of the theater, <laughs> right? <laughs> we do it in the dressing room, you know, within faculty. We know what we're talking about. We're just not willing to own it. Um, and so that is the, that's the real um, sort of striking point now is that if artistic directors and boards can, 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 can really lean into this because then they educate the audience. This audience only accepts what they see on stage as, as the standard. If they don't see it on stage as a standard, then they're like, well, it shouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. If they start seeing it, then it becomes normalized. Yeah. So that's where it, it takes a little bit longer. But I think we'll see more students and more, more candidates mm -hmm. um, in the next coming years. I just hope that most companies are making this part of their like core values and not using it as like an add on. Like we are doing all of this and then we're going to fix that. You know, like this is who we are. Yeah. Um, I guess actually hope is quite um, uh, a good point to sort of move towards because, you know, it, optimism has felt like a luxury for a lot of this <laughs> yeah. year. But hope is a, you know, a human necessity and we have to hang on to that. So I wondered for each of you, um, if we could just end by asking about your hopes for the next generation of dancers. And Kirsten, in 10 years for uh, a young black ballerina entering the profession, how do you hope things might be different for her? I think that just, you know, if I could change something about like what I've had to to live in, I just I hope that future black ballerinas won't have that internal dialogue that I mentioned earlier. They won't have to have that internal dialogue. They won't have those pressures of feeling like they have to present themselves in a certain way outside of just being a successful dancer. Um, I hope that that they they walk into a room and they see themselves on the same playing field as other people and not being like, oh, well, I'm always going to be seen in this light and I have to work extra, extra, extra hard to get to the same um, possibilities as other people. Um, and I just, I think I hope like for their, for their mental health, I think that's like more what I'm thinking about is, is that they don't have, they don't have to have that added weight of, of just 
they can walk into a room and be another dancer in a room rather than walk into the room and be like a black dancer in a room mm. if that makes sense although being black is great <laughs> nothing wrong with <laughs> I have a lot of black friends. <laughs> yeah. Joshua, what about the next generation of teachers? What would you, you hope for them in 10 years or so? Was that for me or? Oh, so that was for Joshua. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> Reflective pause, always good. It was good with the profile. <laughs> I just want to feel a lot more um, about the encouragement, growing healthy young people, mm -hmm. not necessarily that are going to be dancers, but just growing healthy young people that just see each other as more people, you know? Um, openness, love, yeah. That's what I'd like to see in the schools. Okay. And, and Teresa, for the consultant who's going into organisations, training and performance organisations in 10 years' time, what do you hope she'll see that is, is different to today? Um, I hope that, that this is, I have a lot of hopes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I could say, like, I hope that I, I, I don't have a, a job, in a way, right? That it's, mm. that I have worked myself out of relevance in a way um really right like it's not my intention to to have to do this for you know the next 10 20 years but i hope that 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 ballet can okay here's a, here's a good hope i hope that ballet can actually tap in to its original like avant-garde roots right? Where it's like breaking boundaries and it's like, oh my God, the shame and anger. Like, I, like that it becomes courageous, right? And it, it can interrogate itself and, and challenge itself to, to really once again be, you know, a change agent. Um, and if that means by looking like the world, you know, and telling you know all the all the different stories that the world has to offer then that is my hope that that becomes normalized that that it will look strange when a curtain goes up and it's all like white you know you go like huh that's odd like i feel a certain way about it you know that that's that our eyes start to shift so that that the things that were the norm are now you know oddities right i mean that's a lot in 10 years <laughs> but since we're hoping here yeah, um, exactly. yeah. and and, and the, that the, the ballet leadership really is able to interrogate itself and be reflective and honest and authentic about what they see as 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 humans not as like ballet directors yeah. if you ask a ballet director um as a person about some of this stuff, they go, oh yeah, it's horrible, I can't believe it. But as, as it, when they put their hat on, they hold up, right, these mm -hmm. principles that they as human beings don't necessarily subscribe to. Yeah. And so if we can be more, maybe that's it. I hope that Valley can be more human. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I got to it. <laughs> it's not too much to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Less words, less words. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really beautiful place to end. So um, let's end there with, with being human, <laughs> with being yeah. a good baseline to, <laughs> to begin with. So thank you, Teresa, uh, Kirsten, and Joshua. Thank you so much for your time, for your reflections today. Yeah. You've been so generous. Thank you, anyone who's been watching. Um, There'll be a version of this conversation in the October issue of Dance Gazette. There will be a lot more to say about all of this in future. <laughs> but for now, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and goodbye. <laughs>